Welcome to this uh, March 14th service. We are talking about Dennis Reynolds, who's thankfully here with us, uh, his sermon titled Being Humble. And uh, so I would humbly ask anybody who has a question or comment to go for it. <clears throat> um, I'll just, I've mentioned this to Dennis on, on Friday or Thursday. I really appreciated that, that quote from Micah, the book of Micah. Uh, I think it was uh, chapter six, verse eight. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. Um, that would be a nice thing to have somewhere because I think people need to be reminded of that particular concept. There is an organization, MICA Project, that sells t-shirts that read that. Ah, uh, um, okay. And I'm sure they've got like, you know, framed versions of it in a variety of kind of settings. And so, yeah, you, you could proudly proclaim that wherever you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the fact that we were talking about what would we do with all, all our equipment, the, the, the COVID situation has really humbled most everyone because we realized we there's things greater than ourselves that are running the world mm. and uh, mm. we have had all these uh, lovely things technology has helped us out and in that respect that's been serendipitous because of all the all the the other kinds of things that have occurred because <laughs> We had to figure out another way. So those are my yeah. comments. <laughs> no, that's that's I, I I didn't know if Dennis wanted to interject, um, but uh, you know I I also think that while the pandemic has been humbling, certainly you know for especially the religious community. On oh. the other hand, it's it, it's given us kind of for the first time in a long time an impetus to really assert our own power, our our own self-control over our lives. Um I don't know, do do you, do you agree, disagree? Well, one thing that comes to mind is a piece that uh um, a poem pandemic that was, uh, I'm doing a name blank here, but by a UU writer who basically talked about it, that it offered us an opportunity for Sabbath, um, some kind of step out of what we had been doing. And anytime we do that, there's some possibilities of looking at things differently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, um, um, yeah, there's there's different possibilities um, yeah. to change us, you know, challenge us in a whole variety of ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and for example, I went to, you know, virtual Eugene Church this morning and, I, uh, you know, heard a story for all ages uh, delivered by a, um, a storyteller who I think is, you know, somewhere in the British Commonwealth or from the Commonwealth by her accent, then I never would have had the opportunity to, you know, hear a story on a Sunday morning from that person unless I happened to be in the same place they were. Um, and so there are this array of different possibilities. I mean, I'm blessed the joy, you know, when I talk about joys, I get, you know, at least once a week, these joyous little videos of my delightful grandson mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> and I wouldn't get that um, you know the sorrow is he's as far away as you can be and still be on the earth because he lives in Cape Town mm -hmm. but yeah there's different possibilities emerge um, you know in in the midst of transformation hmm. that's very cool uh, Laleen had her hand up I was sitting in the dark, I realized. <laughs> um, gosh, I had so many different experiences today, Dennis. It was just really a, a great experience for me personally. And I realized that, um, well, I guess as we were just talking, that, that really the, the whole COVID experience, the virus experience has been a tremendous 
opportunity for introspection and growth. I know for myself, um, I belong to a couple of different chat groups. And I think we we probably engaged and gone deeper and been more revealing with each other and and had opportunities to express so many of the different feelings that I suspect everyone you know has gone through during this period. There's the isolation and the loneliness and you know for some people real depression and despair and for others, uh, maybe some of that, I think maybe all of us have had some of that, but also an opportunity to kind of dig in and, and find additional resources and, and ways to connect differently and in many cases more intimately. And certainly in our living situations, I mean, being with another person 24 seven, you know, uh, has been a real learning experience for me. And I wanted to tie that impression into what really uh, was very meaningful for me about your sermon today. And it was a whole topic, of course, of humility, but it, it was the idea of finding different ways in our growing process to actually be more humble because the virus itself has been an incredibly humbling um, experience, as you mentioned, I thought you put that so well, you know, I mean, things that many of us maybe relied on for identity or for this or for that, you know, ha haven't been accessible. And, and so we've had to pull into that resource bag of tools. Um, so thank you for, you know, just opening up that whole topic. Yeah, one, this afternoon, my this afternoon's task is trying to activate the personal Zoom account that I just got. Now I have to figure out how to use it <laughs> so I can invite people to do stuff. Um, the Eugene Church is doing a, a, a virtual canvas and inviting people to do, you know, canvas fellowshipping visits. Um, via Zoom. Well, it means I have to have a Zoom account because I'm canvassing five members and I'm going to try to be able to do it on Zoom. So hmm. we just finished being on the telephone, you know, just voices. We just finished our adult uh, enrichment series uh, here. And it was, again, talking about humbling, it was, it was really difficult because we're used yeah. to having these really live, you know, uh, attending discussions. And it, it brought home how limited our connections are because so many of our congregants are not on Zoom, yeah. don't want to be on Zoom, don't use Zoom. I know Michael's pondered this ever since we started doing these discussions. <laughs> how can we get more people involved, right? right. And right. I think with AEO, even the most exciting and innovating uh, attempts, you know, at, at providing interesting workshops uh, brought in probably the full Zoom access from our, our congregation. Yeah. So lots of chances for humility, you know. <laughs> One can't rub one's ego if they have an attendance of five because only five people who do Zoom were really excited about that yeah. particular subject, maybe there were 15 who didn't do Zoom, you know, who couldn't attend. Yeah. Michael, do you have a way to count at some point how many people are actually logging into the sermon? I mean, yes, yeah. we get who shows up. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I'm just yeah, usually we hover around on the low end between 30 on the high end, you know, in the 60s for our for our guest ministers. Um, which is actually representative of what we would get in person. So okay, I'm, was, yeah, I'm I'm pretty heartened by that. Um, we've been joined by Anne Claire, so welcome Anne Claire, and uh, Glenn. And a giraffe. And a, yes, and a giraffe. I put that to my yeah, my background. Yeah. I can change that. Does it bother? <laughs> no, no, it's 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 actually wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Glennis wanted to go next. Well, I was only going to comment, uh, first of all, on the um, technology thing. Uh, 
Zoom has been both humbling and and because there are a lot of people who just don't get it. And um, and sometimes myself included, even though I'm on Zoom all the time. The other thing though is um, twofold. I attended my first GA in person uh, in Spokane. Last year was a GA that was entirely online. And I have to say they did a wonderful job of bringing us all together. And because the uh, price of attending a GA virtually is cut in more than half. And so that more people could actually participate in it. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing is more on a personal level. My, my mother, uh, or actually my father's family, I just found them a year ago. And uh, he, <laughs> I have never met my, my sister and brother that are still living face to face. Uh, my sister's health is fragile. I can't just fly over there, even if, even if COVID wasn't there, you know, because she's got, um, uh, she's got, she's been living with cancer for a lot of years now. And so, uh, and she really doesn't get computers. And so we've had a hard time. Actually, we've done things face to face only on the phone and only exchanging snail mail. So her daughter finally got the idea to, of both of us using the voice chat on Messenger or, or the uh, video chat. And it's the first time ever that she and I had seen each other and talked to each other. And it, it was filled with, oh, you look just like me. Oh my God, you look just like me. You know? And so it was a wonderful discovery tool that would not have happened um, without uh, this technology. Yeah, that's cool. Um, well, Dennis, I, uh, I I was thinking you know, in listening to your sermon, um, <clears throat> the thing that it called for, to mind for me more than anything is, especially after the last like two to five years of my life, I have gone through some radical changes, you know, and challenges to my to my faith, um, and. It seems like uh, like you 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 touched on a little bit of that of like a radical challenge to the way you saw the world when you told the story about the Klamath Falls congregation. Yeah. Um, I, if if it's not getting too personal, could you share with us maybe some some times or some instances where your faith was just shattered or where you you had to change your mind? you know, severely on, on a topic? Well, there's a, there's a direction I considered going with this that uh, um, was a piece from, you know, Marianne Williamson about, you know, sometimes when we're forced to our knees are the times where the greatest possibilities for real change happen, you know, and a piece that comes to mind, you know, for me is, um, the end of my relationship with my ex, with my son's mother. And uh, um, I was flailing a little bit. And that summer, I decided to show up at a discussion group at the UU Church in Eugene. And two different men invited me to the men's group. Mm. And um, I hadn't set foot in a UU Church in decades. I mean, I was involved in youth group, LRY, when I was in my teens and you know till 19 or 20 or so had some contact with some of those folks but you know quite frankly if that relationship and hadn't ended and uh you know i hadn't shown up that sunday um because i was looking for community and connection that the men's group is what took it deep for me for community within the community i wouldn't be here hmm. I'd be, who knows where I'd be and what I would be doing if I hadn't had that part of that time when my life seemed, uh, you know, empty and I felt on my knees. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to do some digging and pondering, but there are those pieces within many sacred literature. And I know some of the Psalms, for example, are, are lamentations, which is the acknowledgement of I am in a place of, of pain and brokenness. And to identify that and acknowledge that 
is the first step towards transformation. Mm -hmm. I mean, in substance abuse issues, it's identifying that one has an issue that's the first step towards healing and, you know, and dealing with it. So I think that's through, true in so many aspects of our life. I mean, I feel blessed that when I had that place and I wanted to seek community, my long ago experience in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, you know, at that point, 20 plus years earlier, gave me a clue of where I might go to find that, you know? And so that's where, for me, the profound importance of keeping UU community alive for possibilities for when people need sanctuary. Um, there's a whole notion about the church as religious hospital, where sometimes people come when they're really needy and then check out and go away. <laughs> well, I, those, those of us who stick around are part of the perpetual nursing staff or medical staff. Or I love staff. it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for sticking around. <laughs> I think well, thank we're you. all sticking around for that, that mutual nursing. Yes. Uh, and Claire, go ahead. I, I had an extremely humbling moment about a day before I watched yesterday. And I've been... Um, holding it knowing I need to do some writing about it because I found it to be quite profound. I, as many of you know, have a daughter who is not well. I was up there for a week thinking, gee, yay, yay, holy, you know, no trouble. Everybody's great. Everybody, last night, of course, that I'm there, we end up in the ER. Hmm. And um, the next day when I was leaving, I got up um, to leave and she's she sleeps late. So I just went in to say goodbye to her. And I bent over and I kissed her and I said, you stay strong for me, okay? And she said, I will, mom, I love you. And I only took maybe 25 steps to my car and I got in and I sat down and I thought that was the most selfish thing I've ever said to my daughter. Be strong for me. Mm. There, there's a lot I got to think about there. And, and um, keep, keep me humble, you know? That's, uh, I gotta be strong for me. She's gotta do whatever it is she needs to do. And uh, I, th I think that'll keep me pretty, pretty humble here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Parenting can be one of the most humbling experiences of our lives all the way across the board. Yep. Um, to extreme examples like that one, and then just those little humilities that, you know, come through the reality of the reality. A parent. Um, it's humbling. Um, yeah. If I could offer a, you know, uh, a, a, a small perspective on that, um, yeah. a, a lot of times, when strength coming from ourselves, I think is not nearly as powerful sometimes as strength um, when you have a, a goal, when, 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 you're, when you're helping and when you're in service. So the idea of be strong for me, you know, I, I get why, you, you know, uh, why, why you feel about it the way that you do. But on the other hand, to me, if, if somebody said that to me, it's like, okay, there's another reason why I need to stay strong, mm. right? Mm. Yeah, my only suggestion that might be an and rather than a right. but. Right. <laughs> yes, yes, right. thank you. Yeah, both of you, thank you, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Laleen had something. I'd like to comment on it and to, uh, Actually, Dennis, you, you mentioned gay pride, um, and I'm going to get to that in, in a moment, but the very first gay pride parade was in Los Angeles on Hollywood Boulevard in 1970. <laughs> and, and Dennis asked earlier, you know, ask a gay person what pride means, and what 
when we were having the planning meetings with New York on doing, you know, the three parades that were the first, New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles, the unanimous support of the organizers in all three cities was that the whole purpose of Pride Parade was first of all about love and support for each other and, and love for oneself. So love and support became one of the major reasons for Pride. Um, another was that, that, that gay is good, you know, uh, and, and, and gay people are whole. And, and of course, justice, you know, there were actually three or four things. Justice was, was huge, but from ground zero one, you know, it was about being strong for each other and being strong for self. And, and I just think that that's probably the key for all of us, you know, in, in, our, in our lives. Right. And, Maybe, maybe we all need to hear that sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes we get, we garner strength from another yeah. when we need it. And you could have been psychically knowing that that's what she needed. Yeah, thank you. As you were leaving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do have to share too that in the back of my mind when I wrote this, Mm -hmm. That little part, I was hoping you would offer some more perspective at this point. <laughs> um, I was kind of counting on it because I mean, one of my learnings is I can't speak of what pride celebrations mean for the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community from my identity. Right. Um, so I need to ask to hear yeah. that. I kind of had a hope you would offer some today. <laughs> well, Dennis. Maybe I'll offer another piece or two then because maybe you'll have other gay clients, you know, or parishioners that would be interested. One of the main organizers of Gay Pride in Los Angeles was Troy Perry, who was founder of the uh, Metropolitan Community Church, which was the first, you know, uh, welcoming really gay and, and lesbian and eventually LBGTQ uh, church. And his offerings, I was thinking about that during the break between the sermon, um, his offerings about that was really um, the uh, love, trust, no, I'm, not, I'm not getting right. Give me just one minute because it just lined up really with what you were talking about. Um, uh, I thought I was going to write it down, but I guess I didn't. Um, but it had to do. It had to do with uh, love, justice, and trust coming from his perspective, and it was not just trust in each other, but it was also that walking with God or walking in humility or walking with spirit, but just trusting that that, that was there for us. And I think that was probably as a, a lesbian, my first exposure to anything that ringed of religion. Because remember in religion, for those of us, me being, you know, near 80 or 79, religion, you know, was horrible. I mean, we were sinful. We were, you know, all kinds of kinds of things. And that was the first time I ever heard a minister step forward and say, you know, walk with, you don't walk alone. You know, we support each other, but we also walk with, uh, with God. And Troy was a very religious person and I had to just deal with the fact this is a minister, <laughs> you know, all of that. So um, that might be helpful to you in future uh, meetings with other gay and lesbian people that the importance of all that started with basically four people and, and one of them was, you know, was a minister who really was looking into the, the soul needs, the spiritual needs of gay and lesbian people. I had the blessing of, uh, I, I was part of a lectionary study group on Whidbey Island and for people who aren't familiar with that lectionary is um, scripture study. And in many of the mainstream um, churches and the Catholic church as well, 
the ministers preach from a lectionary, which is a series of readings that rotate on four-year cycles. You know, yeah. and, um, you know, this Sunday you're supposed to preach around this piece of scripture, and here's your secondary options. And I gathered with a group of the more liberal Christian clergy um, every week. Um, for a UU, it meant I got better Bible study because I went to a UU <laughs> seminar. I'm not nearly as Bible literate as any of the other people in the room. Um, I described the, the, Christian, the Christian and Hebrew Bibles as my favorite collections of short stories. Yeah. Um, for me, they're powerful metaphorical stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, for others, they are literal stories. That's not my, you know, faith. Um, but one of the members of that, who was the hospice chaplain at the local hospital hospice organization, and worked closely with my wife, Suzanne, was ordained Metropolitan Church. And uh, ended up doing hospital and hospice chaplaincy. And uh, um, David started attending the Evangelical Lutheran Church on Whidbey Island, um, where he and his husband were married. Um, the first, first same-sex marriage at that church when the, the Evangelical Lutherans are not what their name might suggest them to be. They are the more progressive liberal Lutherans. Um, mm. and, uh, um, but they were married at that church and he was a regular at that church and became a guest preacher with some regularity at the Lutheran church. And uh, um, he questioned sometimes, he said, you know, maybe we've reached the point where we don't need the Metropolitan Church because many people have been welcomed home. Um, there was a member of the wow. Universalist congregation on Whidbey who left the Unitarian Church um, to go back to the Lutheran Church, which had been the church of her childhood because she could be fully present there as a lesbian and as a Christian, more than she felt she could be, should, could at that particular UU congregation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the Universalist Church in America used to be huge and UU's lost a lot of members when other faith traditions, Christian traditions became more welcoming and they could go home. But for me, that was like, we just needed to be a home away from home till they could go home. Yeah. And the Metropolitan Church did that for many. I mean, I've heard my friend David describe it, did that for him. Um, and now he's ordained clergy in that tradition, but he's welcome in the pew and in the pulpits of other Christian churches as well. I mean, we had him a regular rotation at UU, but we're UU. So. <laughs> right. um, so expected. <laughs> it would be nice to hear uh, maybe from somebody who hasn't spoken yet. There's four of you. Uh, so Connie or Paul, Kim, and Laura He's Lee. He's counting. He's counting. I am. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, grading, I'm grading you all. Participation. Yeah. This won't end up on our permanent record, will yeah. it, Michael? <laughs> oh, yes, it will. <laughs> just, just, just wait till you get your report card. That's oh, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lurley, go ahead. Uh, this has been a very interesting discussion, as well as uh, the talk, uh, Dennis, and I appreciate it, and I thank you. Uh, uh, I don't remember which one of you had said, uh, but anyway. Uh, I have, I am a firm believer in fate and, uh, uh, I, my own life experience, uh, had I not made a mistake and married a paranoid schizophrenic homosexual and bisexual, uh, I would not have experienced motherhood to, uh, my two stepsons. I would not have gone through the pain and agony of losing them. And uh, 10 years later, uh, I was uh, fixed up on a blind date with this uh, Marine and uh, honestly fell in love with him at first sight. And uh, I would not have had uh, 
the marriage of 37 years that I had with him, let alone um, had my three sons. And uh, I, I look back on it and I think how joyous my life has been. And it just, uh, uh, so I guess, I guess you'd call it fate, uh, destiny, or, you know, I was raised Presbyterian and that they went into predestination. Well, um, it may not be too far off in my case, but uh, uh, yes, I appreciated it, Dennis. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> There are those times when we don't know where our path is eventually going to lead. Well, had yes. I not experienced that, I would have never been in um, the position, you know, 10 years later to, all right, all right, my friends were bugging me because they wanted me to go out with this handsome young Marine. And I says, all right, all right, I give it up. You know, I'll do whatever you say, you know. And uh, it just, it all fell in, it all came about. And uh, to the point where you, I wondered uh, often how much I really had to say about my life, that, uh, you know, I was being guided or, or whatever. It just has been a very interesting life. I should write a book. <laughs> 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 well, I, I think there's a reason that fate and faith, you know, are, are so similar in sound, you know, is that if you, if, if you let go, you know, like, like the cliche, let go and let God, you know, if you let go and, and, and just open your mind to all possibilities, um, then that is walking humbly with God. But it took me 10 years. Yeah. To do that, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes it takes a lifetime. Oh, okay. mm. uh, oh yeah, Connie, Connie, go ahead. Um, uh, when I was listening to Dennis's talk, I and about humility and thinking about myself, and what just popped into my little head was um, asking someone for help. And it just like zoomed in. I didn't even get to monitor it. And I got to thinking about, for me, um, when I can do that, that's, that's an act of humbleness. Mm -hmm. And then it made me think of how many times I've said to somebody that I needed them for some reason. And every time I've done that, the person has just been so responsive. It's like, oh my God, Connie, I was waiting for you to ask. So I think asking for help is uh, an act of being humble. Yes. You know, Connie, just the other day, again, sorry, but up in Portland, a lady who's was did walking to go do her shopping. She had one of those carts, wire carts she was pulling. And I was just about to pull into Rite Aid to get medicine for my daughter. And she waved me down and she was about our age. So I certainly stopped and she said, my cart just broke, I need some help. And I said, well, what do you need? And she said, I just need to go. And she gave us like five blocks right past where I was going. And she changed the whole day for me. We ended up, you know, I took her, she, um, she needed help. She didn't know who to ask. And it just changed my whole day being able to, by doing nothing more than stopping and going exactly where I was going. I went a whole one block out of where my route would have been helped her immensely but i bet for her asking for help she if she said when she got in the car i've never gotten in a car with a stranger before <laughs> and i said well luckily we're not going far and there's a police station right there and i'll get you yeah. but you know that asking for help sometimes can be extremely humiliating and and intimidating humbling yeah very humbling yeah yeah that i need help and from a stranger it's hard enough asking your people you think might say yes. 
right? And, and then, asking, and then, and then, and then accepting okay. when it's and on. then accept. Yes, then mm -hmm. accepting. Yes, yeah. Well, and and I think even offering, you know. Um, like uh, I, I was walking out of Fred Myers and there was a, an elderly woman struggling with her groceries. So yeah. I offered to help her, you know, and, and my, my concern was that, oh, you know, is she going to think that I'm trying to rob her? Is she going to think that I'm yeah. trying to like, <laughs> yeah. And uh, exactly. yeah. Did she take the help? She did. She did take yeah. the help. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. that was wonderful. <laughs> and it just changes your, it was nothing mm -hmm. for you right. really. But just just turn it around. Yeah, we are all in this together. You're right. And I still have, yeah, yeah. It was great. Good for you. <laughs> Thanks. Um well, uh Paul, Kim, either of you. It, you don't have to. But... <clears throat> well, uh a couple of years ago, I had had very a uh, lot of anger towards God taking away my my husband. Um... And so I finally decided I should go back to my church and uh, hopefully get some faith in there. And so, yeah, I've, I've been trying to struggle with that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I now teach the little kids there at the church once in a while. Good. That'll help. That'll yeah. help because they provide an amazing connection through they, they see things in such lovely, simple terms sometimes. And I can't imagine how angry I might be at God if he took my <laughs> husband and what you just said, going back, almost like ready to forgive so you can reconnect. That's a huge, huge step, kid. That's like yeah, gigantic. And, you know, people say, well, he's tough. He could take all your anger. And it's like, okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you here know? you go. <laughs> yeah yeah but that's I, a hard spot to be in for yeah you. so now i have this little following these these kids are like are you doing sabbath school today they're smiling little faces uh yeah today's the week yeah i had yeah. six of them yesterday no oh, they're the antidote to whatever it is i think yes has it gotten better a little okay yeah okay a little and I think that's that's part of why, you know, Lamentations, there's a whole book of it, and, and that's the beginning of so many of the Psalms, is to acknowledging that reality that we all have pain, we all have sorrow, um, to refer to a, um, you know, a song kind of lyric, um, you know, and that is the continuing reality. I mean, that's that's dukkha. <laughs> Go back to a you know notion that I shared a you know few months back about right you know, that's sometimes translated into life is suffering. Um, you know, and as I said, that's not quite uh, accurate translation, but the reality is difficult stuff is yeah. significant part of what life is, and this year is certainly reaffirm that yeah. yeah you know the huge realities of <laughs> you know 530,000 Americans and two and a half million people globally have died um, that's enormous suffering um, even though you know we may be amongst the lucky quadrants of, around the planet who have not faced it as directly um, or as likely as directly, just because our per, cap per capita counts are not as high as they are in so many other places. Yeah. Uh, Laura Lee wanted to get in. Uh, I, a little bit off the track, but uh, I don't know how many of you realize that today is Pi Day. And I yeah. thought it was very appropriate that uh, Dennis would be talking about humble pie. So <laughs> I, re I remember that part way into planning how I was going to do that. I went, oh, yeah, yeah it's pie day. Yeah. Yeah. And I got reminded of my house as well. Suzanne, uh, my wife, uh, sold at the church auction uh, a pie a month. And so she's off right now delivering a pie. Um, oh, I, got, I got a little bit of remnant of at our house. But the pie <laughs> with the beautiful symbol of pie 
Oh, I love it. I got delivered, so. Um, but, and you didn't bring any for us? <laughs> yeah, really. Did you bring some to share with all the All the possible serving yeah. of humble pie. It's yours <laughs> to choose whether or not when and where to eat it. You know, <laughs> I, I actually don't mind innard meat myself. Uh, it's... <laughs> Well, that's just, what some people said that that's you know yeah. that's the most flavorful. Me too. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I grew up. I grew up deer hunting. Yeah, yeah. That's it was cool. part of the ritual of a hunting trip mm -hmm. to have liver and onions. Oh and yum! Liver. Yay! Yeah. I, uh, the first deer was killed, so yeah. that was like a whole ritual thing around it. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, Martha had had something. Uh, I, I just wanted to say one of the things that struck me is uh, one thing that you mentioned, Dennis, that this this whole thing of the humbleness of, of COVID, what it's put us all in, that there is more people taking up con contemplative practices, as in, you know, how many people have meditated for the right. first time. And when, what struck me was, first of all, I was delighted, if I can segue, to the loving kindness video. Hmm. It was extremely, uh, it was, it, I just, I wanted to watch it more than once, but I didn't have the time. But it was lovely, Michael. Yeah, I. And the voice was great. Mm -hmm. Was that someone you know? No, no, or... it, it's, it's a UU congregation. I need, uh, I forgot to put a link uh, to it, but I'll, oh, I'll do that it, today. It was just yeah. love. It, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that just set up the whole, the whole mood for what Dennis was attempting to do, which I think was very, very helpful. And thank you for that. Oh, I yeah. appreciate it. Because I, I think those kinds of things add so much to the service that yeah. keep it up keep on keeping <laughs> thank you um oh crickets hmm? <laughs> it's been a it's been a very relaxed conversation which is you know which is nice um maybe we could we we could kind of get a pulse for the room of uh well actually uh, paul can i call on you is that is that all right <laughs> yeah you know yeah. Go ahead. Call on me. <laughs> okay what do you think what's on your mind well i was thinking about humbleness and humility and um for me um i've been learning over the last several years that i'm not in charge. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> I go through life thinking that I'm in charge and that, you know, it's like charge, follow me, everybody. Um, but it's not that way. Um, it's just an illusion. Um, usually the person that gets followed is the one that says, follow me. Um, other than that, though, I think that we uh, kind of need to connect to ourselves in um in a in a vein of humility and know that we're not always right and we're not always in charge and that sometimes it's uh, it's a good thing to be um taking a back seat every once in a while and follow yeah for me, um, one of one of the best examples of humble humbling experiences was uh, the transition of just a few people having information access on their phones to everyone having information access on their phones and being a college professor during that span because <laughs> I would. I would be lecturing and invariably every year there'd be more and more students fact checking me on every <laughs> and uh, the number of things that college professors will get wrong is uh, is a little embarrassing so that's why you want to operate more in metaphor than fact that's right yeah I there's, love no such it. Thing as, there's no such thing as a metaphor check right, right. I right. love it yeah <laughs> 
So, yeah. So, so Paul, you know, even, even the times that we thought we were in charge of even like a classroom, you know, it turns out that Google, mm -hmm. Google can be more in charge sometimes. Yeah. The font well, of uh, all knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> sometimes it's Alexa or Siri that are really in right. charge. Mm. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, maybe we could go around and just just share, if, you know, briefly some humbling experiences. If if I, I'd be curious about that, does anybody anybody feel like volunteering something? Or we could call it a day. Oh, okay. All right, Lillian. I don't want to monopolize, but something just came up for me that I hadn't thought about for a little while. Now that the shots are here. When we think about humbling experiences, um, we may be in for a big wave of something. Yes, ma'am. Not unknown to some of us, but uh, oh, definitely unknown to the masses, and that's called survivor's guilt. Mm. And as people get shots, you know, those of us who went through the AIDS epidemic and were on the front lines of that, um, especially therapists. And, so many of our clients came to us, and I think so many people are going to come back into church with survivor's guilt. I, mean, I can't even imagine being, for example, in a, a senior living facility and, and having large numbers of people, and, and we have an older congregation. And it, I don't know, I just sort of waved over me a few minutes ago about you know, that whole question, you know, why me? Why did I survive? You know, why me? Or why didn't I die? And uh, so that was on my mind. Yeah. Well, especially when you think of like the New York nursing homes um, that lost so many people, you know, that what are, what are they going to go through? You know, I, I just I, think of our own congregation. I mean, we're an elderly congregation, you know, and, uh, it's amazing that in our town, every single facility just clamped down immediately. They didn't wait for best practice. You know, they just shut down and no one, yeah. and, you know, and, and so I just wonder about it, even our own congregation, you know, as we start coming back together, because there are those few that you know, didn't make it. Anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put it. No. Dinner, but you said what's going on. That's it, it's have it's, we it's, had anyone in our congregation pass from COVID? Um questionable of one or two yeah. maybe. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Um, but certainly I I mean we all know somebody who knows somebody, I imagine. Mm -hmm. You know. You're um, getting to be that point, even yeah. though uh, we are fortunate, I think, in part geographically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, New Zealand has done so well because it's an island. Yeah. Um, we've done better, I think, than many other areas because we live at a greater distance than, for example, New York City. Right. Um, you know, and right. so some of those. I just think the vehicle for dealing with all of that is going to be, you know, our congregations and churches. I'm talking in total, the entire country, the entire world. And how else can one deal with the vast numbers of people, you know, that uh, have passed? Yeah. I mean, it took years for that many gay people. And you know, first there was absolutely no cure or treatment or anything else. Um, but, you know, one year, wow. Hmm. It's surprising. It, one thing that I, when I mentioned, uh, during the service that it has been one year. I remember that Sunday mm -hmm. where, uh, well, it was Michelle and, and Lucy recording mm -hmm. in, in the church. And right. then several of us went over to Connie's for a board meeting <laughs> that, that Sunday as I remember. And mm -hmm. it's like the last time I've seen a whole lot of people, you know, uh, and, uh, kept keeping up with phone calls, which is wonderful, and keeping you know with family doing zooms and all. But yeah, it, it's 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 going to be very interesting. We're all very anxious to be able to be together. Right. But you know, right. then 
the, you know, people who don't want to do Zoom, I don't know if they've experienced this kind of togetherness. I, you know, I feel a, a real togetherness when after, after these services, when we get together, you know, you can be yourself, you can joke, you can have fun. And I've had, I'm have a fortunate experience of having several, like four Zoom calls a week with various groups. And although sometimes I'm very fatigued afterwards, but it really, the connection is, it's, I'm very grateful for it. Um, so thanks everybody for yeah. showing up. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, one, there's, there's always positives, right? No matter how bad things can get, there's always something that we can look at and say, yep. yeah, this, that this was good about this situation. And one thing about these Sunday discussions that we're having is our sermon responses never got to the depth of discussion. No, we didn't have time. Things. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. People yeah. wanted to get to Laura Lee's yes. food. That's why. right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One and done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and it is sometimes, I mean, some congregations do like a Tuesday mm -hmm. um, follow up conversation, you know, not on Sunday. Right. Um, and invite people to discuss further. And, you know, one of the advantages of that can be, you know, you have more time to, to even ponder more deeply. Yeah. And particularly if things are recorded, you can go back and listen again. What, 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 what were they saying in that part? Um, you know, and I had the opportunity because I went to church in Eugene this morning. It's like when you post the link, Michael, I can go back in and listen to the version you found. Uh, right. you know, the link. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm at an advantage because I'm editing. So I hear it, you know, several times <laughs> before before it actually goes out. So. <laughs> we didn't have many outtakes this time, did we? No, no, <laughs> no, it's pretty easy this time. Uh, go ahead, Connie. Well, at the beginning of this little part, you talked about us sharing humbling experiences. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I get to be humbled every single day. The minute I walk over to that computer, Oh. It all <laughs> and then and then if that didn't do it for me it's my telephone right. so i have humbling experiences every single day really humbled by technology yeah that when the preacher says amen yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go but Connie another thing i another thing i wanted to mention is that um Oh, several months ago, more towards the beginning of this pandemic, I reread The Plague by Camus. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And the other night, I was looking at it again and remembering at the end of the book where he's watching the celebration, the people's celebration, and being so joyful that things were getting back to normal. And he's asking himself, Will things go back to normal? You know, will we have changed? I thought that was a really mm -hmm. good question. That, that book, <laughs> that book had every feeling, you know, all the experiences that we've gone through during this year. Yeah, yeah. I still think that that book would be a very good sermon <clears throat> vehicle, Michael. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Um, you know that Zaya, um, one of our pa congregation members who had passed, uh, was actually neighbors with Albert Camus in Algeria. Wow. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it was just crazy. Yeah, I, I, I did a service on um, the Myth of Sisyphus essay. Uh, and she, gosh, she talked my, it was great. She talked my ear off for like a half hour about Camus. <laughs> it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I think we've uh, we've wound down. Um, Dennis, uh, can you can you give us any parting thoughts or? Uh, top of my head. Stay yeah. humble. OK, there you go. It. <laughs> Take it. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. You know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, you know, we were re relaxed and and I think that's what I needed today. So, yeah, so have a Perfect. have have a wonderful Sunday. Take care all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dennis. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.